but I didn't know how to make it. So at first what I did was designed a few, like told them like what I wanted from a design standpoint. And they just kind of sent me like a small production run of it. And I was selling it out of my car. It was a red satin hat oh, bag. Yeah. I had these like handmade hats that I designed. I made that out of like satin material and put and put my name on it. Just literally just put my name on it. I called it Brims with Confidence. And I knew they were quality because I went to the factory, right? And I put them in a the bag and I was selling them to people. 98 bucks. What? Yeah. We love the San Gabriel Valley. There are some amazing people and businesses here, and we think they deserve the spotlight. Welcome, Welcome to the, the SGV, SGV Master, Master Key, Key Podcast. Podcast. We'll have on the people that make the SGV great. We'll find out what makes them tick, their ups and downs, their history, and we're going to have fun doing it. This is the SGV Master Key Podcast. And now your hosts, Scott Warmoth and Russell Mano. All right, SGVers, welcome back to another episode here. Thank you for tuning in. If you are a regular listener, we appreciate you spending this time with us. And if you are new to the show, we document and share the stories of the people that make up our great community here in the San Gabriel Valley. I'm not sure when you're listening to this show, but as of right now, when we look outside, it's, well, as of right now, it's windy and, and overcast, but it has been extremely beautiful. The snow-capped San Gabriel Mountains is something, um, and I'm just trying to take that in because it's it's something rare here. <laughs> yeah, actual snowfall and kids playing in the snow. Yeah. Uh, although maybe not right here, but nearby. Sure. Uh, San Clarita Valley, I think. And, and looking at old pictures. Santa Clarita Valley. You would see pictures of the snow-capped mountains. I think, well, that was long. You know, when did that ever happen? But here we are, Scott. I, I find that you're often, or always, almost engaged in some sort of reading book. Uh, and and right now, you mentioned you're reading. Is it a biography? A biography of Harry Truman, and it's just relevant uh, to today's guest. Harry Truman uh, was a haberdasher, and. It dawned on me, I don't know what a haberdasher is, <laughs> but I knew it had something to do with clothes or hats or something. So I looked it up, and uh, yeah, he, haberdasher, from what I read, has to do with the making of hats and mm. uh, or men's clothing and accessories. But yeah, just by coincidence, our guest today is in that field as well, although known as a milliner. Sure. And who's Harry Truman? Harry Truman <laughs> was the president of the United States who uh, took office when Franklin Roosevelt died. Uh, yeah, when Franklin Roosevelt died. And the interesting thing about Harry Truman is that he never had a vice president. So oh, he was president that. for three and a half years and never had a vice president during that term. And the other thing about Harry Truman, I realized the other day is that I knew his son-in-law. Oh, yeah. You learned that through the book. No, no, I, I knew it, but I had forgotten because it was like 30 or 40 years ago that I knew his son-in-law married to Margaret Truman, who was his daughter, Harry Truman's daughter. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's interesting and fascinating that we can learn and find out these things about history and, and reading books. Yeah. And uh, you, you, know, you can also find out about things in the San Gabriel Valley by checking out San Gabriel Valley Now, your source for city news, announcements, events, special savings, and everything SGV. Check them out on Instagram, sgv.now, and read their SGV Now magazine on their website, sgvnow.com. Well, you mentioned hat making, and, you know, I was really excited to come across this guest only because it's such a unique thing, and I didn't even really know this art form existed, and, and I'm, I'm interested to get into what it is, how it came about. So why don't I introduce today's guest? His name is John Narciso, and he is a hat maker from right here in Pasadena, California. John, welcome to the show. Thank you guys for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, I, I'm excited. So, you know, hat maker, what, what does that mean? Yeah, uh, hat maker. So an individual who actually is in the art of making hats by hand, right? From a variety of different types of materials. So rabbit fur, beaver, uh, straw, but it's the actual craftsmanship, right? Not something that you could probably just pull from a department store or from machinery. This is actually taking fabric, having the idea, utilizing actual uh, hat making tools and creating um, different styles from like cowboy hats, fedoras, all types of, you know, styles. So that's, that's what I do. 
you know. <laughs> I, I cannot point to one other person that I've ever known or met in my life to do this. And Scott is mentioning, you know, former president, but is, is this a, this is a unique art form, right? There's not a lot of people doing this. Yes and no. I think, I think probably within the recently, there's been a lot more people um, interested in attempting to do, get into the art form, but it's, it is kind of like a lost art, right? Like you don't walk around. I mean, you'll walk around maybe meeting someone who designs clothes or t-shirts and things like that. But to kind of get into the gritty of like making hats, there's no real blueprint. You either have to be self-taught, kind of be around that world of millinery or hat making in some form or fashion, um, or, <laughs> or that's it, right? Like there's no, there's, you can't just, you don't I mean, go you to might, school. You no, know, there's no school, right? Like you, if you go to, you know, they have a lot of, uh, like schools like fit um, where you can go and learn to be a, a seamstress or a designer or a lot of sew or something like that. You can't do that with millinery or hat making. You just literally have to, you can go online and research and kind of put things together or something like I did. I was self-taught. I kind of just dived into the passion of it and the idea of it and r literally taught myself how to make hats. Like literally taught myself actually how to do it. And from there, um, I decided to kind of do some more research in like, Fun, the fundamentals of like how do you actually make it properly so it stays and it's the quality all the different things that you probably would put into anything that you start from start from new right so that's kind of how i kind of got into it a little bit well wow, that that is a very fascinating <laughs> subject i know that you want to kind of cover some groundwork uh some basic sgv yes and but then yeah i want to really <laughs> dig into this yeah so you know we want to we want to set the framework for for what the show is going to be about for the sure. audience but uh you know the show is called the sgv master key so uh what is your connection to the san gabriel valley i mean living in pasadena growing up in it I've oh, you been grew a, up in pasadena yeah i mean I've, I've been i've lived a lot of different places but pasadena is essentially home for me right like i currently live out there right now I have a, you know, my son, my wife and I, we live out there. My son goes to school out there. So it's, it's, it's always been home and passing this specifically, I feel like it's probably the groundwork and I have my studio out there as well, my office. And that's kind of where I'm based out of, but I love Pasadena. I think it's the most diverse. Um, you meet all types of people down there. Um, it's kind of a hidden gem to be honest. Oh, it's a, it's a jewel. Yeah, <laughs> it really is. Yeah, you know, it's 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 a great place. So, can you can you talk a little bit about your early life growing up here? Like, what are some of the things that you know shaped you to to be who you are and eventually lead to this type of career? You know, um, I had an interesting journey. Um, I mean, I, I was just a typical kid. You know, went to high school out here. So, typical kid going to high school. I was into sports. I was into just whatever teenagers are typically into, right? Like, I wasn't really into baseball and basketball. So you know, going professional or doing it on a higher level was something part of my brain, but I'd never thought about either being an entrepreneur, even remotely thinking about hat making at all. Um, my family, my parents are originally from Costa Rica. So them coming here, like kind of growing up in an immigrant household, it was really like cookie cutter and strict. So it was about, you know, going to church and go and um, doing well in school and kind of just staying out of trouble. Like that's that's essentially how life was. I moved away from Pasadena and ended up going, living in the, in the San Fernando Valley because I went to college out there. So I lived out there, I think probably all of my adult life until I started moving around after college and things like that and made my way back to Pasadena. But fundamentally um, where like I kind of got my grittiness or my entrepreneurship is really from my, my home life, like my family, my parents, right? They instilled in me to work hard, don't complain, be grateful. That's literally how I grew up. You know what I mean? So. Oh, I, I think maybe you're the first person I've ever m met from Costa Rica. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So, so is that part of your, was that part of your culture growing up or did they want to assimilate and be oh, American? No. no, it was, I mean, you, <laughs> I guess, no, nah, there was no simulation. There, there was like, this is, this is, you know, cultural, culturally wise, you know, from food to language to, um, like just the energy that we put into our family, like in the love and the hard work, that was just who we were. We couldn't, you know, there, there was no simulation, but I think education was huge growing up, right? And being able to never take no for an answer, 
you have to work hard. That's 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 the that's the minimum. Um, and, and anything else that you want to do after that is on you. But working hard, going to school, um, succeeding, like those are things that was kind of instilled in us. So, but kind of thinking about it, like I guess in hindsight, my grandmother, my father, were big into style, and I think I didn't really realize that until recently. Like, kind of where did I kind of grip? Because it wasn't at home. It was like, where did I really adopt this idea of style and just like entrepreneurship is, is through like my family. My, my grandmother was an entrepreneur. She was a seamstress. Uh, my father was an entrepreneur. Um, so I'm thinking like, oh, maybe that's what I was kind of paying attention to kind of coming up. It's kind of how they were functioning and, you know, being business owners or creative in any respect of what that was. So um, so yeah, <laughs> uh, go back a minute yeah. uh, to your family coming here. Were you born here? Yeah, I was born here. You were born here. Yeah. So they came. Yeah. But uh, I mean, growing up, you know, in that household, you go back, you know, like right. it's, it's, it's normal to go down there. You know, your majority, my grandmother still, one of my grandmothers still down there. Like majority of our family is still in Costa Rica, but also on the East coast. Okay. So probably I spent a lot of time going back East as, as a young kid. Um, New York and New Jersey and places like that. So that's kind of like a, a a big gumbo of kind of me growing up, right? Like I didn't just stay here. I was shipped off to the East Coast during the holidays and things like that because we still have family there. Majority of my family was there. So did you go to Costa Rica much? Yeah. I, as I got older, it got harder because I was in school and things like that. But now it's like now that my son is older and he's like really interested in learning about like our culture because he's talking to my parents and he hears the accent he hears the language we get care packages all the time of just different like foods and little little trinkets that we still use in our day-to-day lives so he's asking like what is this or like he had his, like he had a first piece of it's called barinto it's like uh costa rican candy it's like butterscotch so my son had it for the first time two days ago um, and now he's just like hooked and that's like never give an eight-year-old yeah. candy so that's just <laughs> weird i'm getting photos from my daughter who's in costa rica oh really yeah what part? do you know what part she's in uh i could probably tell you i could show you a picture uh, um uh, the the reason I'm bringing that up, and I'm going to look for yeah. where she is, but uh, Costa Rica to me seems to be um, a country. Uh, it's it's not really a third world country in a lot of ways. It's sure. more developed and has a legal system that yeah. is pretty similar to the U.S. And so it's not quite one of those Im- impoverished countries. I mean, that, there's there's parts of it. Don't get me wrong. Like uh-huh. there there are parts of it that you know. It's it's definitely the hood for sure, but um, it's definitely modernized. Like I mean, a lot of people are going down there, whether they're building businesses, retiring, just living. Especially during the pandemic, everyone kind of like oh yeah needed to leave. Uh, uh, La Fortuna, do you know? No, nah, I'm not too familiar. That okay. sounds like they might be on the Pacific side. Okay. Um. So that that, that that's probably probably on the Pacific side. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. But, but boy, it's it's lush and beautiful, isn't it? It's gorgeous. I mean, like, honestly, I, I think now, like, people are really, like, relocating and, like, developing land and, like, trying to put their life there because Costa Rica is a lot more modern. Like, they have Walmarts. They have everything you need out there. Like, San Jose, like, where, which is the capital and where everybody pretty much goes to first, it's New York City. Like, it's, 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 it's just the most modern regular type of town if you kind of go down more across the country so more towards the atlantic side it's more of the jungle ish um less modern it's a beautiful place like we plan i I have plan on trying to go you know hopefully later this year but um it's something that i i have to get back to you know it's it just seems to be one of those well you were talking about pasadena as a sort of an undiscovered gem yeah. type of thing. Costa Rica seems to be that as well. It's becoming that, yeah, people, you know, I kind of want people to slow down, though, because you're taking, to, you know, getting too excited at my country, so you guys got to <laughs> slow down. <laughs> when you said your son hears the accent, what, what accent is that? So with our family um, from Puerto Limon, Puerto Vio, it's which is on the Atlantic coast, which is closer to the Caribbean side, the accent is more derived more of a Caribbean accent. So if you, a lot of the black and Indian mestizo people in Costa Rica, which are from Limon, um, are Jamaican descent. So 
the way they speak, the way they talk, the way they carry themselves, the culture, the food is very influenced by Jamaican culture. So, you know, after the slave trade, a lot of people, they came, you know, they left Africa and they, some of them got dropped off in the United States, some, some in the Caribbean, and then some in South and Central America. Uh, but on that specific coast are a lot of, even though we speak Spanish, understand it, you go to school there, you still have an accent of more of a Caribbean accent. So my parents sound like they they would be from a, probably a Caribbean country if you maybe just hear them, but it's it's definitely influenced by by Spanish dialect, right? So it's very it's it's unique. It's a beautiful accent. They talk really fast, especially when I used to get yelled at um, <laughs> as a kid. But yeah, so he hears that and it's like triggering to him. So it's like wow, he's so interested in it. And he's, I mean, and you grow up, you kind of like develop the accent. It's a, it's a thing that you kind of just develop. Can we hear the impersonation? That I, it's, you know, <laughs> maybe in the, maybe during the show. I, I'll, I'll start. I can't just do it. You know what I mean? I think you hear it more. Like if you ever hear me talking to my parents, or I just got done talking to my parents, or anything like that, you know, it's there. But it's 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 hard because you don't know that you developed it. It's just you hear it. You know what I mean? Even like like learning language. Certain certain English words, I hear it through how my parents hear it, right? So when I was coming up in school, I would have to learn certain words a little differently. Even with my even with my son, like growing, like he used to spend a lot of time with my mother, um, and then when he went to school, he would say certain A's and I's the way she says it. So the teachers would ask, like, "Well, you know, is where's where are you guys from? Like they didn't know where we were from, right? Like." Like, he was like, Ethan, we're from here. What do you mean? <laughs> and he would just, like, you know, as a small child, you're developing language early. And you base it off of what you hear in the household. So it was just so funny. And I never even thought about that. He To me, he just, you know, to us, he just sounds regular. But when the teacher pointed it out, I'm like, oh, wow. It's just that right there, the influence of just kind of being around my mother or being around us or being around family. It's He's gravitating to it. You know what I mean? So um, I thought that's cool. I'm like keep it, man. Like it's you're gonna. It's, it's a beautiful thing. It's part of our culture. It's a, and it's now. It's a I family. have never heard of a Costa Rican immigrant community. Yeah. Like maybe you've heard of Honduran or Guatemalan. It's or, a small population in Cal. Like it's not many people out here. I think yeah. you'll find that community on the East Coast, right? Like you find that like Panamanians, Costa Ricans. Um, like you said, Hondurans, you'll find that more on the East Coast in California, you'll find more of El Salvadorians and Mexicans. There's a huge Nigerian population. Um, yeah, just a huge African population as well in LA. So, but yeah, there's this, it's very, very small. You're not going to find, and if you, if you meet anybody out here, they're probably related to me, to be honest, uh. <laughs> they're probably a family or one of my dad's <clears throat> friends growing up or something like that. So one of the things that you mentioned about growing up was this thing and I, I believe you said, don't accept no for an answer. Yeah. And I contrast that with my upbringing or like, let's say Japanese culture where they're like, don't make waves, mm. you know? And I just like, I can just see that there's a huge difference in culture there. Like yeah. my mom or dad would never, never tell me that, you know, but there's a, there's a power in that though, you know, to not accept no as an answer. But yeah, um, that just struck me as, you know, a really cool thing. I think the thought process was, and you kind of mentioned it too, like you asked me that question, like, was it just strictly, you know, cultured infused or was there some simulation? You know, I think there was a, a bit more simulation with us. Like there was a little bit leniency because they want us to adapt. They want us to progress and kind of get further in a lot of the schools um, or just, you know, where we're at. So I think that idea of not taking no for an answer is even if you do hear, you know, hear no or that's the answer, you know, that's if that's what you hear. That's not really the answer. You just have to find a different way. Right. Like, don't be discouraged when you hear no. Expect to hear no. Be OK. Be comfortable with no's. Just be so be more uncomfortable with no's than yeses. You know what I mean? And and, and that, that was kind of the thought process, thought processes. And I think I just took that and just locked that in. So when I finished school, you know, finished high school and went to college and was kind of moving around trying to find, you know, college at that time, you kind of find your identity and find who you are, or who you just, who you want to be, essentially. Um, that's kind of how I was kind of navigating. And I think, you know, kind of tying it back to being an entrepreneur in hat making, that's kind of how I understood why this was my passion. Cause it was something I started from the ground up. Like there was no training. 
it was something that I just was interested in and I just decided to make a choice one day. Like, I'm going to run with this. I'm going to actually figure out how to do this. And from there, that I don't take no for an answer has always been kind of like part of the mantra of me growing and developing, you know, as a creative and just as an entrepreneur as well. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I've, I contrast that experience growing up with one of our most recent guests, uh, Lisa, who was, you know, successful in corporate, but paralyzed because she was brought up with this, if you can't do it right, you know, mentality, you know, don't yeah. do it. And she was like sort of fearful to step into something that she didn't know. Eventually she did, but, you know, it seems like, you know, having this mentality gave you a jump start from, you know, earlier on where, where she had to break through that. W where did you go to high school? John Muir High School. Okay. Yes. So I, I'm, I'm curious, like, how were you accepted amongst your peers there being that, you know, you're from Costa Rica? Did they, did they figure that out or they're like, oh, you know, you're, you're a Costa Rican. <laughs> Honestly, it's, just, it's, I have this conversation like enough, um, meaning like with my wife, right? My wife or just friends or peers, or when I meet other like Afro Latino people, because it's not very known for people to be Afro Latino out in California, at least. Well, it's the first time I've ever heard that phrase. The phrase. Yeah. yeah. It, it's more of an, a, more of an American term, to be honest, like. Like my, my parents wouldn't refer to themselves as Afro Latinos. Like in Costa Rica, they're just Costa Rican. Like there's no like I'm gonna add something to it to to simulate to new nuance. You know what I mean? It's none of that. They don't yeah. think that way. I mean they're older too. They're probably not even thinking that's not even a thing. So <laughs> um but it was interesting, right? Like I I mentioned that my parents are from Costa Rica. My 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 dad's my I have my their Narciso last name is Nicaraguan. So, you know, they're from Bluefields, Nicaragua. Um, that's what Narciso is. It's not a Costa Rican last name. It's it's a Portuguese Nicaraguan last name. My grandfather um, was a Portuguese and Nicaraguan. So I have I'm Nicaraguan and Costa Rican. Right, oh. countries are right next to each other. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now Nicaragua is more of a a more impoverished country. Impoverished, yeah, it's a war yeah. country. It's it's a lot tougher. Um, but I set out to say, um, growing going up in high school, I had a lot of like very ignorant human beings. Like there was a lot of ignorant people, to be honest. Like. Them thinking um, Costa Rican was synonymous with Mexican, right? Like they thought it was like the same thing or because they're just unaware of what what Costa Rica is or even where it's at. So they've always asked me, what are you? They thought I was Cuban. A lot of people always thought I was Cuban, um, either Cuban or um, or like Colombian. But nobody knew what Costa Rican was or anything like that. So I had peers that, I mean, my I, had, I was cool, you know what I'm saying, like, Friends were my friends, but then you had kids who were just dumb and ignorant, and <laughs> they thought, you know, Costa Rican was assimilated with Mexican or yeah. something like that because they just they never met someone from there. So because they hear the last name, they're like, "So you're not American? So what are you?" Right? Like that's that's the thing. So I mean, it didn't really like hit me until I got to college, to be honest. Like how much it bothered me then, though. Oh, yeah. Okay. It what bothered me a little bit. What happened then? You just, I mean, because you, I didn't meet that many ignorant people because I met, a, I went to Cal State North, which was a very diverse place. So I met a lot of people very similar to me. So Panamanians and, 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 and people from Puerto Rico that are black and all types of different people. So where they're like, yeah, I've had similar experiences. So I was like, okay, I'm not crazy, then, right? Like, <laughs> but yeah. you know, at, the, at 14, 15, it's like after hearing it 20 times, it's a little, it's a little annoying, right? But it didn't allow me to it stop me from anything. It just was like, okay, again, you know. And and for the listener who may not know, Muir, the demographic at John Muir is uh, has what fifty percent African American. Yeah, it's, it's predominantly black and Spanish. Yeah, so um, yeah, yeah. I'm just curious. Is your son experiencing that? You know what? It's interesting you ask me that. He's he, because he goes to a school where he's predominantly the only black kid. Um, there's black other black kids, but. He's he is predominantly the only young black boy, and um, he doesn't understand it yet. We see he's had incidents at school where kids just are just like, and it, they could it could be because they are just you know their household and they don't know what's going on. He's experiencing just kids just picking on him. And I don't know if it's a race thing. I, I don't, we don't jump to that, but it's something that that we try to get him to understand. Like you know. Be proud of being black. Be proud of who you are. Be proud of it. Don't let anyone f make you feel inferior or feel isolated. Um, it's on them type of thing. Like, they don't want to play with you. That's on them, not you. 
you know, and I think he's starting to really understand that just to kind of, cause our job, my job is to make sure there's a lot of confidence no matter where, make sure you're always comfortable no matter what room. Cause there's gonna be some bad rooms where you're not comfortable, but as long as you stay comfortable, the result of what happens after you leave doesn't even matter. Cause you st- you're, you're yourself, you know what I mean? People are gonna be dumb regardless. So I give them like a lot of raw talk, but you you scale it back cause he's eight, right? So you <laughs> focus on making sure he's reading and having fun and playing, ba- playing baseball, have fun in that. But I try to keep an eye on that, you know? We keep an eye on it pretty closely yeah. just cause of the time we're in. So you have to kind of keep an eye on stuff like that. Sure. So you you move on to college, CSUN. CSUN, and yes. you meet some people with similar experiences and where does your journey go from there? It it it, it kind of just stops there, to be honest. Like I think I think it was almost like a breakthrough of just like okay, you know, there's people like me. Um, the people that were ignorant like that, I didn't really take it to heart like that to where it's gonna affect my my continuous growth as a as a man as a person. But just it is good and feels good to to know there's more people like that, especially being you know because you always feel like. Either you're not black enough or you're not Spanish enough, right? Because you don't look it from an exterior standpoint, and then black black American people kind of look at you like, well, you know, you don't necessarily know what we're going through here because, and I'm like, you'd be surprised <laughs> because if you see me on the street, you wouldn't know yeah. any of that. So my experiences are are probably the same, if not more, right? Um, I'm just getting it from both ends of you know one community to another. Um, but I think I have such a diverse like friend group or, and, 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 and I've been around so many diverse people. Um, and growing up, I was around my parents. I was around a lot of diverse people. I didn't grow up with that type of prejudice mindset. Like I've been around all types of people and it's been okay since yay high. So nothing has ever been like one group is, uh, the other group is no, that's not how I grew up. Mm-hmm. My parents were, it was important for me to grow up. Like that. I mean, my godmother was Filipino growing up because my mom was a nurse and she grew, worked with a lot of Filipino people. So I learned eating, eating a double chicken and certain, uh, certain uh, culture things of the Filipino community to where that was normal to me, you know? So when I was like, when I got older and just being around it, whether it be in business and work and friends, I was able to just be be comfortable with wherever I was at, regardless if they were uncomfortable. You know what I mean? So that's kind of the same idea I'm kind of instilling in Ethan, my son. So we're we're fine. You know what I mean? We're comfortable. So always be comfortable with yourself. Yeah, that's something kind of just kind of took and ran with, right? Sure. Now that I have children of my own and I see how they interact with people, yeah, um, I, I firmly believe like you know prejudices and, and racism is is something you have to teach children you have to you know they yeah. don't they don't come out and nope. and have those things on their own you know <laughs> agree yeah yeah it, it's, it's just plainfully obvious obvious to me anyway well yeah so so after college yeah did, did you go right into making hats or kind of right like the the passion like when i finished school i think that's where the passion start to really because i used to wear hats like just let me put that out there i actually used to wear them i thought i was fly i used that was my mm. thing right like that was that was i used to just wear hats you know just not necessarily wearing suits all the time, but I used to really try to clean up really nice. You know what I mean? Um, and I think the one accessory that I really li- loved and liked was hats. It was paper boy caps, old school newsboy caps. Mm-hmm. It was, you know, certain style fedoras. It was bowlers. It was all of that. I used to just, you know, any little money that I did have, you know, as a broke college student, it's very limited. But any money that I did have, I'd go get me a nice hat. So I'd have like boxes of hats, maybe like 20, 30 hats. So people kind of knew me wearing a hat. And just one day, and it, I, I had my, it was a Stenson hat. Um, shameless plug, there we go, right? <laughs> That's uh, what I wore the other day. That's a Stetson. Stetson. Stetson, yeah, yep, Stetson uh, hat. Over at the yeah. museum, yeah. The quality hats. Some, yeah. Actually, I, I would use them as like my blueprint. Like I would oh. buy the hats. But you would buy one of those? Those are about 500 bucks, 700? Yeah, I mean, back, yeah, yeah. Some of the more higher quality ones, but back then I'd probably find one for 150 or you go on like, Craigslist or something like that. You can get a used one that's still clean, and I'd try to restore it and then wear it. Like I used to do that a lot. I would restore a lot of hats oh, and yeah. then try to either try to sell it later later oh, on, but or just wear it. Like I love this hat, so that's kind of where I kind of like started to really like. I was like, wow, I want to see how these actually made, and that right there was like that click in me. Like 
I want to see how hats are actually made. So that took me, and I'm like at the last year of college, you know, getting ready to graduate with my degree and all that stuff. And at that point, I'm like super curious. Like I'm going to get a job and do all that stuff. Like I have a business degree, but I'm like super curious and was passionate about figuring out how like hats were made. How did you learn? I took my last, I think I was like four or five bucks I took and I flew to Ecuador. And my mom didn't know this for a long time. I flew to Ecuador and wear authentic Panama straw hats, like the be- beautiful quality ones are made. I went there, went to the factory. I was talking with this guy. Um, I kind of met like in the fashion world. He was like, yeah, I, 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 I live down in Ecuador. And this is a gamble, like I'm just like gambling to, to fly down there. But I built a rapport in the business and I was like, you know what? I'm interested in maybe like learning how to make hats. I just said that just to see if he'll show, you know, I didn't know what I was asking for, but he was like, if you ever come down here, I'll show you how the factory is. Long story long, less long. Ended up flying down there for a couple of days and he I toured one of the factors of where they pull the straw and actually weave the straw for straw Panama hats. That, I, that right there flew back to California. You know, at that point I was like, done with school and I just was like you know I want to figure how to do this I was like I wouldn't I was like super inspired and from there I went on YouTube I went on Google I researched other like hat makers and just saw what tools that I need but I didn't know how to make it so at first what I did was I since I built that relationship with that factory I was like what can I do to like start selling hats so I just designed a few like told them like what I wanted from a design standpoint and they just kind of sent me like a small production run of it. And I was selling it out of my car. Like I literally was just selling hats out of my car. I got some fabric from downtown LA and made little hat bags. So the hats would fit in the bag and it's like a drawstring, almost like those little bags that you get in like, um, you know, when you go on those corporate retreats and they kind of give you swag yeah. and it's in those drawstring bags. I made that out of like satin material and put, and put my name on it. Just literally just put my name on it. I called it Brims with Confidence. And it was a red satin hat oh, bag. Yeah. I had these like handmade hats that I designed. Um, and I knew they were quality because I went to the factory, right? And I put them in a bag and I was selling them to people. 98 bucks. What? Yes. <laughs> where were you doing this? Oh, at the time, where was I living at this time? I was living in Glendale. Me and my buddy, we had an apartment in Glendale. And I was living out there. Just a little regular two bedroom. You know, we're young, young cats. Just, you know, and I was living out there and I was selling it out of the car. Um, I used to walk into up and down Melrose and, and, and Robertson in LA trying to sell it to boutiques getting rejected like and the designs looking back at it they were like horrible but um, but yeah that was like a hustle I was doing I had a job I was you know working in um, advertising I'm working for an advertising firm so I had to pay my bills pay my rent so did you sell some yeah I, I sold hats because they were <laughs> like wow John like you re- like either friends or people that knew me they're like, why are you really selling hats? I'm like, yeah. I'm, and I think because I knew how to dress, I knew how to style it. So it looked like it made sense. It was like, oh, okay, I see you. It's almost like if you, you know, were suits and ties every day and then you just came up with a tie, a, tie, a, a tie type of, you know, line. I'm like, oh, that makes sense. You'll just buy it because it, it, it makes sense coming from you versus you just come out of nowhere <laughs> and start selling hats, right? So I think people were like either doing me a favor or they like the hats. I don't know at this point, you know what I'm saying? But I think I thought that was like, you know, I dived right into the the idea of this. Like how, how much time does it take to make one hat? Um, if I do it straight through, it would probably take me about a week and a half now. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. So you need to sell that hat for a thousand dollars if you're gonna make one hat. It's yeah, gonna take I mean that's that's roughly what I you know, we're close to to that price point. But right now, I mean, you know, if Fast forward to right now, I'm I'm about like if you want a hat made like right now, if you say hey, I want to put a hat in, it's about four four to five weeks turn around because my queue is so backed up right now. So I'm about four to five weeks. Do you have assistance now, or do um, you do everything yourself? I do everything myself. I did, you know. I'm just trying. I think I'm at that point where I got to bring some more people in right now to kind of help because uh, we're scaling right now. So it's time to kind of alleviate some of the tasks that I'm doing on the day to day and just kind of focus on the design and the production. But I mean, I have help. I've had people come in and, and supplement just for certain admin stuff and, you know, to kind of put together like a little workflow for them to kind of handle. Do you have a store? I have an office and studio down in Pasadena. So I took, um, it's like a showroom where I see clients, but I also during the pandemic, um, cause I'm a little cheap to save costs. I built a workshop in my backyard. So I was like, you know what? 
I'm gonna just gonna build this workshop out here. I have the space. It, you know, we're all from we're all at home, so and I'll just do everything there. And I like it. I mean, it's it's easier based off of like my current life right now. So it's easy to kind of do everything. And then if I have to go see clients, I go to the office. I'm about I live about I live by the Rose Bowl, so I'm maybe about ten minutes away. And these the office is by Old Town, so 10, 15 minutes away. See, yeah. yeah. Well, John, we ask each guest to bring an item with them. What did oh, you bring with you today? I actually brought a couple hats. I mean, I had a hat on <laughs> when I came in, but, you know, I couldn't. But they also brought um, one of the hats and also a hat box. Yeah, so for the listening audience, this is a, a large black round or cylindrical box. Yep. Let's okay. show your name on the top oh, okay. of the yeah, box yeah. Uh, right here. Right here? Okay. Let's yeah. Do that. Because it's Boom. a nice, elegant looking design. Oh, yeah. That's uh, beautiful. Design. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. Which I, I would assume you did yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I had, I had help. A buddy of mine, Tony, he helped me kind of put, like, the, yeah, he's another brand guy. Like, he just was, you know, he, you know, he's kind of helped me. Like, when I rebranded my company, he was somebody that was, like, with me as far as, like, I told him the vision and the aesthetic and what I wanted to do, and he kind of put the idea together for me. So, yeah, I credit Tony all the time. It's a classy yeah. look. And... Uh, rebranding was it brims with confidence? Yeah, because I lost a, I lost like fifteen grand because I didn't know what I was doing, oh, <laughs> so yeah. I had to like start over. So, and that's the thing with entrepreneurship, like you you make I I, I learned so much. It wasn't even a loss. I just learned so much to yeah. where I made the money right back, and it wasn't even about a financial aspect. It was just about knowledge and insight of how to structurally run a business, and then I had to learn about my business because. Consumer products is just different. And then at the time where I was like pivoting, fat, you gotta be on fashion trends, you gotta know what's going on, you gotta know your market, you gotta understand, are people actually wearing ads and who are the buyers? The price point, the time, the production run, can you fulfill that? Do you wanna do direct to consumer? Do you wanna do retail? What do you wanna do? Wow, that that is a lot to know uh, yeah. besides being able to make a hat. <laughs> yeah. So you're multifaceted. I think I think going to college and, and, and paying attention in class helped. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think it I finally got to and then what I used to do too, like, you know, I wasn't always independent and just, you know, working on my hat business. I had I worked. So I always I used to curate the jobs that I would work at. So I'd work in tech, I'd work in advertising and the positions I would take, I would learn from these companies. Like these like I didn't like school like that, so I used work and jobs as a training ground to understand how businesses ran. So I worked primarily in, in the marketing and advertising department because I was like the field I was in. So I learned how to market a product, and I, like how to do it digitally, and when it pivoted to tech, how tech influenced that and marketing went down, and how consumers dissected consumer products, especially specifically in fashion. So it was all insight, I just spent I was paying attention. That's all I did was pay attention yeah. from paying my bills on time and developing credit and doing all the right things. But then taking all that, so I was never in a rush to build this. And I think once I started to slow down and when I failed, I guess you could call it, and I started to really pivot and rebrand and do it correctly, I really took my time and like all the detail to the branding on the box, yeah. the type of box, the aesthetic and the style, what's gonna make me different where am I going to position this? How do I want to be accepted? It's amazing the the again the themes, the common themes. You know, the passion, learning from another person, yeah, and failing. Oh, All yeah. of these are just keep keep <laughs> occurring in in the people we interview, who, who are all successful people yeah. ultimately. But you know, it's because they have these traits. They know how to overcome things. Yeah. But I'm sorry, we cut you off from no, showing your product. <laughs> so now we we looked at the top of the box, right? <laughs> yeah. And now, let's see. No no one can deny that John is passionate about hats. Right. <laughs> I am passionate about hats, yes. So this is just one of the designs, right? Um, this oh, is Wow, a, that is, uh, <laughs> it, it. you know, we go looked go at ahead. something. It, it, it has, a, is this similar to a Stetson? In a sense of material, yes. Okay. I mean, the style is like a bolder type of hat. I think the little difference, I don't know if you remember seeing those boulders, it's like almost like a, um, it's a very old school, right? People, oh, performers yeah. used to wear those hats, but predominantly they would wear it in straw. Mm. So you never really see it in a, a rabbit felt material. Yeah, this uh, is beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, it looks I really mean, nice. just well designed, well built, and just the aesthetic of it. You know? Thank you. 
Appreciate that. Is this the final form? Is it meant to to maintain this shape? Maintain the shape. Yep. It's um yeah. So the the idea was to recreate like a boater style hat with the flat brim, you know, and, cut. And you uh, actually created this yourself. Created it. I sewn the sweat. Yeah, flip it over. I sewn the sweatman in. That's the logo. All of all those details. I put all that stuff together. Who are your buyers? Who would buy this? Wow, it's you know <laughs> what's what's amazing about like my demographic of buyers is they they're they're starting to range and starting to expand. Um, they're not so linear anymore. So it's it's people who want to take chances and who's always had the desire to be a, a hat wearer. And obviously, hat wearers are the biggest people. But the people who like style, who like who like craftsmanship, it is a real style. This people it? who yeah. who who care about who who care about style. Even if you don't care about style, they care about a quality hat. And I think that's where people are starting to really gravitate. Even if you've never worn a hat before, you're starting to really like see the idea, see something different, um, kind of step out of yourself a little bit. Okay, so I could see an artist, I could see an entertainer. Yeah. Uh, I could see a person who has this sense of style. But what about a, a the CEO of a company? Will you You'd be surprised. Those, those are the majority of my Is buyers. that right? Yeah, yeah. people who are just aware of themselves. Mm -hmm. They're aware of just the things that they like, regardless if they like those type of people always have a, a certain type of mindset. Like I like something and I want it. Right. So those are the people yeah. who, who care about, like, I want to start wearing hats. So they just start wearing hats. Right. They don't have to be convinced. You right. know, my buyers yeah. aren't people I have to convince. Yeah, there is a certain confidence, and I don't know why. But That's what I was going to say. He's selling, like, this self-confidence type yeah, thing, you exactly. know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and yeah. if you look back 100 years ago, uh, men were men and women all wore hats. Well, it's culture. It was, it, was, it, was, it was culture. It was exactly, I mean, if you didn't have a hat, something would probably yeah, be wrong, right. right? Yeah. But it's part of their appearance, men, women, children, and I think there's a similar thought process amongst the people that purchase or even inquire about John Narciso hats, right? Like they care about it. And I think that's where I've always wanted to talk about my story. Like I really care about the craftsmanship. So that's why I'm so. Yeah. Um, it looks like beautiful craftsmanship. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's why I'm so bold and loud about the actual process of it. Like I love the process. And I think if you see there's a theme in my life, I've always just cared about the process, always been present about the process. The end result is the end result, but the process is what I care about so much. So I never just, like limited myself to that, right? Like yeah. once I got to the destination, well, I made it. Nope. I'm keep and, and I still do that with with learning millionaire. I learn learn learning the craft more. Like I don't think I'm a great craftsman, you know, a great millionaire. I think I'm cool. I think I'm good. I think I'm I'm still learning more and more technique. I'm getting better at it. I, I'm tightening it up. That's well, something, you know. Have you met other people like yourself? Are yeah. there other people in Pasadena doing this or, uh, you know, across the country? I mean, I know there's there are a hat, there's other hat shops, but I personally met maybe one or two other milliners, like, in person. But there's other people across, you know. The country? Yeah, the country, L.A., and uh -huh. stuff like that. I think my perspective and my perspective, and I think if people like my perspective, that's all I really care about, right? Like, I think you can get caught up in comparing yourself or looking at what other people are doing and and that's in anything though right like if you really believe in your perspective whether it be design you know media writing whatever it is there's always going to be more of who you are right like we're not reinventing the wheel right like we're just yeah. doing something from our perspective it's so eye-opening to think of a hat uh, actually have you ever given much thought to a hat you know i i used to wear ball caps right? yeah and and then i I think it's called a walking cap. That's what I remember. Mm -hmm. I, I really liked it. It had like a, a round back and it, it came, you know, together in the front. And I enjoyed that maybe in my 20s. Uh, I liked it. I liked it that it was different. Like there wasn't a lot of people walking around with that. Um, I have long hair now, yeah. so I don't, I don't particularly wear a cap. But I, I, I enjoy hats. And if I've, you know, I've put on a Stetson before. And the feeling of it, you just know it's like this is a really quality yeah. product. Yeah. You know, it's 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 you hold it in your hand and you're just like, you know, I was in the military and so like my, my friends from Texas, their their idea of getting ready to go out for Friday, Saturday night was, you know, 
blue jeans, a, a, a belt buckle with from, from, from something that they actually won in a, in a huge hat. Yeah. And that was like normal. That's, that's, that was like stylish for them. And it was like eye opening for me. <laughs> so you've worn a Stetson. Have you ever worn a John Narciso? <laughs> I, I have not. But you know, I, I think I saw someone on a talk show wearing a hat of yours. Isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a friend of mine, JB Smooth, he's a comedian, um, an actor. He's, he's worn, he's worn hats of mine. And then just other like other celebrities and things like that. JB Smooth. It yeah. sounds a bit familiar. I think if you see him, you'll it's gonna click. Did uh, he do a lot of things with uh, what, what's the name of that? Oh, um, he's in Curb Your Enthusiasm. Oh, okay. Have you ever seen that show with Larry David? You know the writer of Seinfeld. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, exactly. That's where Leon, the, yeah, the tall right. black gentleman with the bald head. Uh, yeah. That's right. him. So. Yeah. Um, great show by the way it's a fantastic show. <laughs> um but yeah he's he's a he's a he's a good friend of mine and you know he's someone that's been supportive of, of my i think i saw him on a on on a seinfeld um mm -hmm. special or something as well yeah yeah oh and also um god rest his soul it's for twitch a lot he was on ellen um oh. he was somebody who wore wore my hats as yeah. well yeah uh, wow yeah. did you get a shout out on the show I mean, they weren't talking about that, but they were. The, the cool thing about it was both great. You know, he, he's a great guy. Both of them were wearing my hats at the same time, oh. so I thought that was pretty cool, right? Yeah. Like, so yeah. I mean, I've 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 built built this brand, you know, literally from the ground up. How did you get into that um, into that marketplace? How did you um, end up selling to them? Honestly, it was like a friend of a friend. I mean, I think it initially came through JB, who's who's someone I've known for seven eight years, but it was one of those things where like word of mouth, some of those fundamental things just go a long way. Somebody that you, you know, you do well by and you, you know, you build a good relationship because it's really about relationships and they'll talk to you about some, to somebody else and they'll reach out to you personally. And, and that, and that just circles. Right. So I'm, I'm going into different rooms. Like the hats are on a show called blockbuster. So basically the, you know, the, the, the actual store blockbuster that we did a comedy on Netflix and JB, who was a character on it, his character wears nothing but my hats. So Netflix reached out to me oh. and they wanted me to design, basically, I think he's wearing about five or, I think I designed like eight or nine of them and they use about five of them. Um, and his character is wearing my hats like the entire like episode. So that was cool. And I built the relationship with the costume designers yeah. and now they know me. Uh, personally to wear any other Netflix show that comes up and they need a character that has hats. They know they can call John and, and, and it'll get done, right? <laughs> the work gets done. <laughs> wow, that's really awesome. Well, uh, John, I'd like to get into more of uh, maybe the process and what else you've got going on. I sure. see that on your social media, you yeah. you can highlight your hats, but you often highlight the process, which is I see you creating the hats. So that speaks to you know your what yeah. you were saying about appreciating the process. But uh, let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. Cool. At Wormuth Law, they believe that just because you speak a foreign language, come from a different culture, or simply don't know how to navigate the legal system, that should not prevent you from compensation from injury or receiving benefits. Their multicultural staff have been helping SGVers like you for over 38 years. Visit law888.com or call them at 626-784-7017 and tell them you heard about them on this podcast. All right, we're back with John. Uh, John, before the break, we were talking about the process and some of the things I see on social media. Yeah. Uh, before we get back to that, though, we're going to go on to this segment where we read two questions from this card game. Okay. And this was uh, designed by a former guest on the show. Okay. Uh, we don't get anything from this. We just kind of enjoy it. They're just little icebreakers. Sure. There are two questions. You can uh, you can answer one, both, or none. Okay. So no pressure. First question, what is your favorite Disney movie? And second question, what book has influenced you the most? <laughs> I'll, I'll go first. Okay. My favorite Disney movie, 100% is Coco. <laughs> Oh, Coco. Yeah, yes. yeah. Yeah. It's just so touching. You know, I have I have a young daughter and it, I, I love it. We we love watching it together as a family. When you say Disney movie, are you, are you talking about animation? I, I guess it can be a Yeah, cuz I mean there's a lot of Disney movies that's not animation. Yeah. Like, yeah. So whatever whatever Disney movie, but that's the one that came to mind, yeah. Coco. <laughs> or what or what book has influenced you the most? I think for Disney movie. 
I think I think it's I mean it's does it count if it's on Disney Plus? <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> Only because I don't know if it's a Disney movie because it's on Disney Plus. I, I'm assuming it is, right? Okay. So so it's two. One is Encanto because we we've been watching that movie re- religiously so much. Yes. And then the other one personally is Heavyweights. Heavyweights. 1994, 95. It's basically a group of kids who went to I don't know this is correct, fat camp. And this old mean like owner of this camp was basically trying to starve the kids or not really help them, but he was taking money from the parents, assuming that your kid will come back in shape. <laughs> so basically, um, he <laughs> he basically just was stealing the money. Um, I forgot the guy's name who was in it. Uh, it'll come back to me. I'll, well, I'll come back to me who who the the main character is. But yeah, heavyweights. Okay, yeah. awesome. M- my family loves Encanto also. Encanto's a man. <laughs> my, sing along and everything, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Well, guess who my my daughter's favorite character is Luisa. Luisa, yeah. <laughs> And so she's, you know, she's lifting these like sticks yeah. outside and she's like, look, daddy, I'm doing this exercise. <laughs> Louisa, Louisa, yeah. Yeah. I guess if you don't, if you don't know the movie, she, her character is like really built and like she's lifting. She can lift anything, right? <laughs> like she's strong. Yeah. I've got heavyweights here. Ben Stiller. Ben was Stiller. Yes, star. yes, yeah. yes, yes. That's what I was thinking about. Oh, he's, he, is he the villain? Yes. Okay. Yeah. He's, he is the owner of the camp or okay. the, the, the director of the camp. Yep. That makes sense. Yeah, I remember that one. Yeah. <laughs> if you look, you, do you see a lot of the characters of like they're like they're known characters? I just oh yeah, there's a lot of it's like an ensemble type of yeah, thing. Yeah, it's one of those type of things. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. So I always want to watch that, and then nobody wants to watch it. Yeah, now, that's so. definitely a Disney picture. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Scott. Wow, Disney. I I don't know. I you know what about a book? A book. Um, a book, I would say, well, obviously the Bible, right? Um, outside of the Bible, I would say Ulysses by James Joyce. Oh, is that about Ulysses S. Grant? No, no, it's uh, it's a fi- commonly considered, I mean, in the realm of books, considered the greatest novel of all time. Oh. Uh, just the most complex, most um, most intricate novel it, it, well, if you want to study it, you take a college course. You can't wow. just read the book. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. It's it just yeah. an incredibly, incredibly rich and beautiful book. But it appealed to me because of its um, references to, to understand that book, you first have to understand the Catholic religion, the Bible. You have to understand... Uh, Greek mythology, and you have to understand philosophy and art. Yeah, it's just a rich book, yeah. It sounds quite intimidating. <laughs> well, you can't read it. You just can't sit down and read it. It, yeah. has, it, it, has, it has one sent, one sentence that is probably 20 pages long. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but it is the most incredible book. If if you've been prepared for it, it most incredible book you could ever read. Yeah, see, but <laughs> nice. Well, thanks, thanks for sharing about. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, this that book. that sort of deadened. The, <laughs> we were talking about hats, and all of a sudden, and you, 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 where, did you, where did Ulysses come yeah. from? <laughs> <laughs> Don't uh, break your glasses, there, Scott. So. John, back back to you, and yeah. and uh, you know you're speaking of the process and how you you enjoy the process, and uh, I see that in what you're doing online, social media. So, what's going on now with your company? You said that you're looking to to grow, or you feel that it's you know in this yeah. Space. I mean, we're it's I mean, production is for me. I guess internally, it's 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 growing and it's continuing to grow. Like I haven't had a a slow month. Um, I think, and that just comes with the awareness of my company and my brand. I've been doing like what I'm currently doing is I do a lot of trunk shows and that's something that's helped with the growth of the business is kind of being in front of the people going to different places. I'm very selective on like where I do a trunk show. I don't just go anywhere and set up shop. I, I, I like to curate it to like the aesthetic of the brand and the look and the feel. So it all looks intentional and not, not staged. Right. Like, so right now I do a, an event called the hometown hangout in Culver City, and that's a market that I've grown a lot as far as customers, and I have a lot of clients that live in the middle and 
west side of Los Angeles. So it helps them, you know, come see me and meet me and we can do stuff like that. So we put together an event called the Hometown Hangout and I do I do I display my collection of, of, of hats and um, I do live hat making. So sometimes I'll, I'll, I don't do it all the time, but I'll just come pop up and I'll bring some equipment and I'm like making hats there. And, you know, it's a cool way of taking the process on the road, taking the show on the road. And from there, I think people want to be a part of the process, right? Like the way people consume, it's like you can't just put the product out there and expect something to grab. Maybe that worked maybe 10, 12 years ago. Uh, but now I think people want a reason why. And I think the process to me is your why. It's seeing that you're getting a customized bespoke hat and you're you're seeing the process from my perspective, right? Because you might see, you might run into somebody else making hats online and that's fine. But I think I'm very specific about how I do my process, um, share like what I do. And I mean, essentially, and then you see my, my like where my mind is trying to, like where I'm trying to go with this particular piece, right? Um, with the details, with the color, with the, I like, I like symmetry. I like shape. I like boldness. And I, you'll see that in my work, right? You'll see that um, my pieces, I love really bright colors. I don't like my hats being so busy with a lot of stuff on it. I like the hat to be in its raw form. I think one of the pieces I, I had on my head, it's a simple hat, yet it has a lot of personality. And I think a lot of my clientele and my, you know, people who, who love my work, love that aspect of me, right? Like I, this is kind of where my heart lies is, is the symmetry and the shape and the natural unorthodox feel, right? For some of my pieces. So that's, what, that's what's important to me. Yeah. It has a nice full touch. Yeah. I it's mean, different. It's, yeah. Right. Like it's different. And then you'll, you'll see me like, that's where my mind is going as far as wanting to make a short crown cap or a short crown hat like that. You know what I mean? And you is know, touch important, touch and feel as is. much as yeah, design, I mean, design, aesthetic look like like ha, like the type of fabric I use for particular pieces is important. Right. Because I my end result, I want a certain look. So certain fabrics. So if I want a super wide brim, like straight edge brim type of hat, I'm going to probably use a higher quality material because the rigidness and way it, it, it holds after the steam and water and, and iron, right? Like if that's my end goal, so I know the type of material to use for that particular piece on that particular block. So it's figuring out how to execute it properly, right? So so yeah, that's that's super important. The quality to touch, how it feels on your head, how it sits, um, that's, that's important to me. And when it's custom, you always got to make a little adjustment here, a little adjustment there, because you want to get it perfect, right? Yeah. So, so yeah. <laughs> the listening audience who can't see you, you know, you really have a sense of style. I mean, right when I, I saw you come out of the car, I was like, <laughs> the yeah. wind is blowing. <laughs> yeah. You know, and when I see it, I, I can appreciate it because it's it's some, not something that I, I have or I feel like, you know, it, it's part of my personality, but I mm -hmm. can really appreciate it. What would you say to the person who maybe doesn't feel like a hat is for them, but, but likes it and, and wants to sort of, you know, figure out, like, what do you say to that person? I mean, my job is to figure out like, what your goal is, right? It's really the discovery of understanding, like you like, you you want to try it for the reason. And what I'm trying to figure out what that reason is. Is it just because you've always thought about it? Um, and we go from there. Cause I get clients like that all the time. They call me and figure and try to figure out like, I really like that, but I, I, I don't know. I've never worn a hat like this. Well, okay, let's fine. Let's, let's talk about what you're going for, what you've been thinking about. My job is to make sure that it looks right. Like, trust me on that part, but let's, let's figure out what you have in your head and we can kind of recreate that. And that, and you know, I never try to put something in that, that like I know based on personality after talking with them and where they're trying to go with that hat, I would never put them in something that just doesn't make any sense just to sell a hat. Like it, sometimes it takes one or two conversations. Like I've had people come to my office a couple of times and to that third time was like, okay, I'm ready. This is what I want to do. Mm. Yeah, I've done that. It's 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 not a problem, right? Like that's that's part of this process because I want you to be happy and I want you to feel like when I have my first on the CISO hat, it's like this is the right hat for me. And I've had people travel from Costa Rica and and and, and other countries. A lot of the the clients that I currently work with, they love. And I've been seeing this more. They like to take hats for vacation. Like a lot of my for something something happening in December where. I had clients that were coming up seeing me, driving out here from like 
you know, Woolen Hills or Calabasas or whatever. They're like, I'm going, I'm going to Paris or I'm going to London. I'm going. So I'm seeing that they're seeing my style in certain arenas. So they're, they want to look. So they're looking for that right hat to be on vacation with. Right. Like, so that's something that's important to me. So it's like, that's a question I ask. Like, are you going somewhere? What do you want to do? Is this every day? I could find you. We, we can work towards that. And once I, ha- I have that understanding after all that discovery, then we can talk about putting this project together, putting this piece together for you. Wow. It's so fascinating. And there, the time has really fl- flown by. I never yeah. knew that, you know, learning about hats would be so fascinating, but really if someone is passionate about what they do, I, I, can, I can listen to them and I, and I can really get into it because yeah. that's certainly what you are. But John, we're going we're gonna to move on and find out uh, some other things that you're passionate about in the San Gabriel Valley. Okay. We call this the SGV3. Uh, we want to know three, you know, with a hat or without a hat. <laughs> what are three places, events, mm. or activities that stand out in your mind about the San Gabriel Valley? Okay, so... I like going down to Old Town. Old Town is a, a great place for me to just kind of hang out. I think it has it's pretty diverse as far as the types of food, the look, the feel. You get all types of people down there. You mean Pasadena, right? Pasadena, yes. yes, yes. <laughs> down in Old Town, Pasadena. I'm sorry. Yes, Because yes. there's a couple of Old Towns, right? Yeah. Old Town, Pasadena. One of my favorite places is Edwin Mills. Oh. Yeah. Edwin Mills is one. Uh, Edwin Mills, the owner, has been on our podcast. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Teddy. Teddy, yeah, I've, I know Teddy. Yeah, I know Teddy. Teddy's a good guy. Yeah, what do you like about it? I think I think the energy and the just the, the I mean the food is great, but I think the ambiance is is wonderful, right? Like you go in, you can have a cocktail, you can you can sit and chat. I've had clients come there and just kind of meet me, you know, if they couldn't come to the office or I'm just not there. They've met me literally at Edwin Mills for a drink or something like that. My wife and I have done date night there. I think it's it's a and live music. I love that aspect of it. Right, what he's done with the outside. I live think that's music so cool. Is, yeah, um, I got to call Teddy now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Um, uh, yeah, because I have some and, ideas and, that I, wanna, uh, I think I want to execute. Um, but I think, but I, I love everything about that. I think that's like the perfect spot. So yeah, I go to that place often. It's one of my my, my really my, yeah yeah it's one of my places I love going. Teddy and I always hang out at Burke Williams right across. Oh, the right across. Street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I love Brooke Williams. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, it's yeah. not about me. <laughs> there there I, I sometimes try to make it that way. Oh, so what are a couple other places? Uh, um, honestly, I <laughs> one of my favorite places to eat at is King Taco. Um, oh. I just, I just, I don't know what a, somebody has said that before, I believe just recently. Really? Oh, Aaron, yeah. Aaron Sanchez. Yeah. Right. I yeah. love King Taco for years. I mean, it never gets old to me. Yeah. I think I just you know, flat out. I just love the food. Yeah. That's what you, I just love the food. Are you a red sauce or a green sauce guy? I'm a green sauce. Okay. Green sauce. Yeah. I, I, I have to do the green sauce. Um, I even like a little bit of cheese, you know, sometimes. Um, but yeah. Yeah. A little bit of green sauce. And what do you get there? Tacos, burritos. I mean, those are my go-tos normally with a smoked piña. That's, you know, something to drink. Um, sometimes I get chips and guac or chips, chips and salsa or something like that. So Awesome. Yeah. And <laughs> now I want some tacos. Yeah, I might <laughs> actually go after this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and a third... Third, a third, a third, a third. Honestly, I've been spending a lot more time going to the Rose Bowl. And I think maybe because I lived literally walking distance from there, but spent a lot a lot of times going to the Rose Bowl just to walk. Like I went I literally walked the other day. It was it started raining too. It was raining, but I was like, you know, I, I gotta I, I wanna be able to get some air. I wanna just just kind of move and stuff like that. And so I literally walked from the house to the Rose Bowl. Um I didn't walk around it, I just went up and down the hill. But the Rose Bowl is amazing. I mean you know, I've been to the. They have those every every second. Oh, the flea market. The flea market every yeah. second um, Sunday. F- flea market's great. They just always have you know a lot of events and stuff. That's like just that. a great gathering place. Yeah, the Rose Bowl. You know, every a, a every lot of night fine, good it, finds there too. Every night yeah. people are running, and I, I lived there for ten or fifteen years, and I I was there every night. Yeah, it, you know? it's it's great. Just, it's so that's that would probably be my recent third. So yeah. Awesome. John, I'm, I'm really glad that you came on the show and, and shared your, your your knowledge and journey in, in hat Thank making you. with us and with our listening audience. Yeah. I appreciate that. This is exciting. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, John, if someone wants to get John Narciso hat or get in touch with you and have that conversation about what is the, the best hat for them, how, how can they go about doing that? 
social media is you know, one of the, the better things um, to, to reach out to me, um, whether it be setting an appointment, coming down to the office. It's at John Narciso Millinery. All, no space or anything like that, all, all together. So John Narciso Millinery. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I, I, I would expect that your hats are going to be everywhere soon and, and people yeah. are going to know that name. Yeah, yeah. there's no doubt. Yeah. <laughs> ah, thank you. Guys. Yeah. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Well, there you go. There's another uh, show for you. I hope you enjoyed that. I certainly did. I learned a lot uh, about hats and hat making and, and more so about the passion that really drives. And, and that's a real common thread in our show. And I hope you were able to, to see and experience all that passion from John. I, I know we certainly did. If you like this kind of content, please consider subscribing and drop us a comment. Let us know what kind of shows you do like. And if you want to check out the full catalog of episodes, check out our website, sgvmasterkey.com. And until next time, we'll see you then. You've been listening to the SGV Master Key Podcast. Our passion is the small businesses and the people that make up the San Gabriel Valley. And it's our honor to have them on the show. We hope you've enjoyed it. Make sure to like, rate, and review. The show is produced by Russell Mano. Edited by Victoria Allers of Kind Monster Productions. Thanks for listening and see you next time on the SGV Master Key Podcast. Master. No, kind of matter.